aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around the world on ThinkTech Live broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii in Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. The title of today's episode is World Press Freedom Day in War Zone, Ukraine Media Keeping Truth and Hope Alive. Today, I'm so fortunate to be joined by Olga, who's working with the NGO Media Initiative for Human Rights as the co-founder she was making sure that the world would be aware of what's truly happening. Olga, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me today. Um, it's uh, very important you pay attention to the uh, events in Ukraine and what's happening now. So it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. We know it is World Press Freedom Day. Can you share with us why it's even so much more important in Ukraine right now with what is happening? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, uh, as according to the uh, official information, more than 80 uh, crimes were committed against journalists uh, since the February um, in Ukraine. Uh, they were committed by Russian uh, troops, and uh, unfortunately, uh, 23 journalists were killed. Two Americans are among them. And... Uh, in the ongoing war, the uh, danger for journalists and for press is um, increasing, you know, and uh, but uh, those people are still trying to uh, to tell truth to the world about what is going on in Ukraine. So uh, in this day, I think we have to talk about the um, uh, this uh, the uh, dangers of uh, this work and uh, to to say that um, war is the best thing, but it is uh, very, very dangerous for journalists and for those who are working on the war zone now. Very true. And it's very exciting that you created this NGO, Media Initiative for Human Rights. What was the impetus for that? You know, it is the NGO. Uh, this NGO consists from the former journalists who had to become uh, a human rights defenders uh, <laughs> once again because of war. I, I'd like to emphasize that the war in Ukraine started in uh, 2014. And um, uh, I used to be a journalist on that, on that time and I went to the war zone. But you know, when, when you go to, to the front line, uh, front, front line and see the, uh, what's going on there, you see the suffering of the, of the people, you see uh, how uh, civilians are killed and so on. You, you can't just tell a story and go ahead. You have to help those people, even uh, um, especially if it is uh, children or, or people who can't help uh, themselves. And um, so I, I saw these stories and um, I tried to, uh, to do more for them. I tried to, uh, to help uh, to uh, relatives of kidnapped people, to, uh, kidnapped people to find them. I, I tried to, uh, to tell more about their stories and so on. And then I um, uh, came back to Kiev and talked to my friends and uh, Told, uh, told her that uh, uh, it is like uh, mind blowing uh, when you are uh, near the front uh, line and uh, then you come back to peaceful um, cities and see the, how people just uh, walking, just sitting in the cafes and so on. Uh, and uh, it is uh, too difficult to uh, to tell truth about the war in the in this situation and uh, she told me that uh, humanity created the way how to talk about the war it's, it's uh, uh, international humanitarian law and uh, when you um, try to uh, to talk uh, with uh, people about the war uh, according to these uh, like red lines you know what what is good and uh, what is bad uh, during the war um, it is it is easier, and so we decided to create um, this media initiative of human uh, for human rights. And uh, we uh, first of all we uh, we were trying to highlight uh, to cover uh, the situation uh, with the human rights violations um, in in occupied Crimea and uh, Donbas, uh, 
Uh, then, when we uh, had uh, already a massive of information, uh, we um, we had to, to do something with with it, and we um, we started to adv advocate the uh, some some solutions for Ukrainian government or international community. Um, and uh, also we've done uh, in, in journalistic investigations uh, which were uh, were helpful to our uh, prosecutor's office and uh, uh, we for example we uh, investigate the enforced disappear disappearances in Crimea in um, uh, 2014 and or um, the crimes committed uh, Actually, we uh, we investigated the crimes committed on both sides, and uh, unfortunately, uh, from Ukrainian side as well. Um, Ukrainian troops in the uh, 2014 also were sometimes uh, had committed uh, some war crimes. Uh, it of course it's not like uh, uh, the scale is different with Russia in Ukraine. It is not systematic. It's uh, but um, there, there were some crimes, and uh, it is very, you know, complicated to um, to tell about um, uh, crimes committed by our troops uh, to our society. Uh, our society sometimes are not prepared for it, and uh, of course, they uh, don't want to hear about the uh, uh, these crimes. But we tried to do this, and after that. Um, Different uh, different laws uh, where um, draft laws uh, where um, like uh, in our um, parliament and um, so they uh, these laws help uh, to um, make um, uh, this impunity from the both sides not um, such a big thing yeah uh, so after that um, so. We, we've done a lot. We've done a lot, and we were prepared for the this uh, large scale uh, invasion. And uh, we uh, we had an experience how to deal with uh, all these uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And now we are um, uh, dealing with these uh, crimes uh, in the different regions of Ukraine. You know this. Uh, Awful occupation of of Kiev region, Chernigiv, Sumy, and um, our last investigation is about the uh, enforced disappearances in Kiev region. Uh, when uh, this region uh, was occupied, we um, uh, we knew that uh, uh, some people were taken hostages there in, um, and uh, they were taken and kept. Uh, in some facilities, but, but after uh, the liberation of these uh, regions, uh, th those people just disappeared. We didn't know where they are, and we investigate that uh, they they uh, for, were forced to to go to uh, Russia, Russian prisons through Belarus, and we uh, identified more than two hundred uh, names of uh, just civilians. Uh, who are, are uh, taken as the hostages now in Russian prisons, and nobody knows what to do, how to release them. Uh, there are no instruments or mechanism how how to release them because the, there are no officials in Russia whom we tend to talk to. So uh, now we are talking to international community, trying to to find some mechanism to release those people. Uh, one more direction of our organization is uh, the uh, human rights of uh, servicemen, militarians, uh, military personnel. And you know, uh, for now, we uh, have a number uh, of more than 3,000 uh, prisoners of war, uh, Ukrainian soldiers and officers who are kept in Russia. M many of them are wounded. And um, you know, the terrible uh, uh, situation in Mariupol. Uh, with uh, Ukrainian Marines, and um, as once again, we uh, we have no instruments to release them, uh, but we hope at least that uh, they won't be tortured by Russians because we have uh, enough information about the tortures and um, the tortures of our uh, 
uh, soldiers and uh, the, the treatment is not proper uh, and uh, they have uh, no uh, medical aid, they have uh, no even, uh, sometimes they have no, no even food and water. So uh, this is what, <laughs> maybe it's not a um, topic for morning <laughs> to talk, but uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry for this. Uh, I hope that uh, um, your mood uh, for the day will be okay after after my story. Well, Olga, I thank you so much, and we appreciate your courage and bravery. The initiative you're sharing really ensures that the world knows what's happening through documentation and constant coverage of the conflict. I also appreciate you giving that full perspective that it didn't all begin in February. Many people have forgotten that aspect, so your documentation of the dastardly actions that have happened the entire time, but also your commitment to honesty to make sure that you focus on the rule of law. And it sounds like what you're doing now really does uphold the Geneva Conventions on both sides and make sure that everyday people who are caught up in this conflict are protected as much as possible. So that is so important. And as the world commemorates International Press Freedom Day to honor the role of the fourth estate, in a way, you're speaking truth to power, but you're also upholding the freedom of expression. And so you are, through your daily actions, keeping truth alive in the Ukraine. So it's okay. It's a little after breakfast anyway. And I think more people appreciate being fed or by you the truth on those spoons of what needs to be done. So we thank you about sharing all that you can with us today. In a way, maybe you could share some of the most important issues regarding war crimes that you've documented so far that the world needs to know about? Yeah, you know, um, our uh, Press Secretary General, General Office uh, opened uh, more than 10,000 proceedings uh, about war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, it is a large scale and uh, uh, very systematic um, like method, you know, uh, war uh, committing war crimes is a method of war for for Russians. They they use it like instrument to uh, to break the resistance of Ukrainians. And um, our organization is dealing with, um, as I mentioned, uh, with enforced disappearance, uh, especially of active people, of visible people in different regions who can be a leader of protest or something like that. For example, in uh, Kherson region, um, more than 50 uh, people were kidnapped and we uh, have no information where they are and what happened to them. Uh, it is like uh, civic activists, um, uh, it is a uh, measure of uh, towns and cities. Uh, it is. It can be uh, veterans or uh, or any even even teachers and uh, and heads of schools, they they are also kidnapped and um, uh, we don't know where they are, unfortunately. So uh, and as I told you about the situation in Kiev region, the same uh, we uh, inv we investigate we are in investigating for now the situation in Sumer region where also a lot of people were abducted and. Um, transfer to uh, to Russia. And as we see the same practice in different region, we can uh, talk about these, uh, the uh, uh, general policy of uh, Russia. I think that uh, those decisions were made in Kremlin. Uh, not, it, it, is, it, is, it was not uh, the decision of uh, one commander or, or some war or so on. The, the practice is uh, very similar in different regions of different uh, units of Russian troops. So uh, uh, as, as we see, uh, they try to commit genocide uh, because they, they try to um, kill as many people as they can. They try to, um, like, uh, to, to scare uh, the whole society by the uh, awful torturings by the uh, uh, public killings and so on. And um, this is, uh, you know, um, as, as I've said already, uh, we were prepared for the, uh, for the Russian invasion because we have been dealing with 
uh, the war since 2014, since Crimea and Donbass. Uh, but uh, those, it, I think it's too much pain for, uh, for our um, society, for Ukraine uh, at all. Uh, we, we even uh, couldn't imagine that they have uh, make uh, such atrocities, you know? And um, so um, that's why uh, what what we um, have to do now is to document as much as many cases as we can, and then to uh, decide what to do with it. Maybe to uh, some um, uh, we prepared with uh, lawyers who prepared some submissions to international criminal court, but uh, they won't take uh, the whole. Uh, situation in Ukraine, they uh, can uh, like uh, take to uh, to the inten intention uh, some some episodes, but not the whole situation. And uh, the lawyers uh, are talking now about the creation of special mechanism to uh, bring uh, uh, Putin and his regime to responsibility. Uh, it can be like a special tribunal for him and his. Um, like uh, and the authorities, yeah, of uh, Russia. Uh, what what uh, the mechanism will be? Uh, nobody knows for now, but the discussions is going on, and um, I hope that uh, in the nearest future we will understand. Um, we will understand what uh, what uh, facts. Do uh, do we need to provide for that me mechanism? Because uh, we are trying to document uh, for now uh, as much as we can. Uh, it is very difficult because in the occupied regions there there are no internet connection, no mobile connection, and uh, we have very less of information from from those regions. I I'm talking about the southern regions of Ukraine near Crimea, Kherson region, uh, Zaporizhia. Uh, region and uh, also eastern regions like uh, Don Donetsk and Lugansk region. And um, those hostages who were uh, taken previously be be before the uh, Russian full scale invasion, they are they also still uh, in prisoners. And uh, I want to remind you about political prisoners in uh, on the territory of Russian Federation about Crimean Tatars who were detained uh, for, for the last time. And uh, the activists of Hizbut Tahrir, Crimean Tatar uh, organization, which is forbidden in Russia, but was allowed in Ukraine. And after the occupation of Crimea, a lot of activists from this uh, uh, organization uh, were detained. So, um, and, you know, um, and one, one uh, more thing I want to pay your attention to uh, is the um, uh, forced deportation uh, of uh, Ukrainians to Russia. We um, we can talk about the number about more than uh, five uh, hundred thousand to uh, which were dep deported to Russia because they have no any chance to survive. Uh, Russia, uh, the Russian troops uh, didn't allow uh, people to go to uh, the ter territory under Ukrainian control, um, and uh, they have uh, they had to go to Russia, and after that they uh, they went through the so-called filtration camps, and after that they uh, forced them to to go to very depressive regions of Russia on the Far East and, and so on. And uh, uh, people there have no documents, have no alternative information about uh, what is going on in the world. They have, uh, they can listen only to Russian propaganda mm -hmm. and uh, they have no access to, uh, even to the South, to, to call to their relatives, uh, to tell them where they are. Uh, so uh, the the situation is awful, but it is not new in in the history because previously in the during the Soviet Union, uh, 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 Soviet Soviet power uh, Soviet authorities uh, 
have been do had been doing the same. Uh, you know that they uh, deported uh, Crimean Tatars, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians, Polish people, uh, and um, even uh, the deportation of Crimean Tatars in 1944 was recognized uh, as a genocide by many countries in Ukraine as well. So uh, the the, pra the practices are the same as uh, as it was in the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, uh, Moscow nowadays is like a continuum of uh, Soviet Union, and this uh, this state uh, have has to be collapsed. I understand. And I'm here now at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and we've been working with the Crimean Tatars for over two decades. And they did document how life got even worse since the invasion of Crimea. And they also then gave insights to what you're now experiencing. And the sad part and what you've been raising as well, besides the Crimean Tatar Indigenous Peoples issue, is that it seems there's a in a national plan and a program of action that's being sent from the Kremlin that uses Geneva Conventions to violate each and every one of the articles to inflict as much harm and try to break the resistance of the Ukrainian people. And the point that you brought really highlights something that didn't get enough attention where many people were not able to flee and go to a safe space in Ukraine, but it is so important to document what's going on so that the world's aware and how people's human rights are being violated. I've even heard that there is an attempt to crowdsource digital evidence of war crime where everyday people are being able to share this information. And so we thank you for all the work that you've been doing in that capacity. Can you share in some ways how you've been able to use the information so far and to move things forward as well? Uh, our NGO is the member of the uh, 5 a.m. coalition. Uh, it is um, uh, Ukrainian, a coalition of Ukrainian human rights organizations. Uh, we have uh, already 27 members, and uh, we um, just uh, united to, to document the war crimes and crimes against humanity because the capacity of uh, uh, each separate organization is not enough for this such a scale of the, of the crimes. So uh, we uh, we joined together uh, to do this, and uh, we have um, different directions. Uh, some organizations are focusing on documentation, uh, documenting uh, of the uh, crimes, and some uh, who uh, have a lot of uh, lawyers and uh, professional. Um, who, who are specialized on the different juridical issues, <clears throat> they are focusing on uh, um, the preparing of uh, submissions to the um, uh, ICC, to the European Court, uh, and um, they mostly are discussion, uh, discussion this um, uh, issue about the special tribunal for, uh, for the uh, Russians. Uh, and uh, so, uh, for as for us, for our media initiative for human rights, we have monitors in different regions. Uh, we are talking to people, interviewing them. For example, uh, yesterday and today, uh, our monitor uh, have been working in Zaporizhia, where uh, people from um, Azov Steel uh, plant uh, came and. Uh, uh, so uh, we were interviewing them about the awful conditions just, just, uh, which uh, which are there, and uh, it is you know it is quite difficult because after this shocking situation, uh, not uh, every person will uh, will talk to you, and uh, you have to um, create some special. Um, approach to uh, to talk to uh, to those people after after those uh, situations after sometimes they uh, their relatives were killed on their eyes sometimes uh, they they are wounded sometimes uh, this is um, this uh, may may be persons after sexual violence and and all those uh, awful things that are committed by Russians 
but uh, we uh, our NGO has a trust of uh, people and uh, of course all all this information are confidential and uh, we we share this information all, only after the confirming of uh, persons of uh, victims and uh, witnesses but uh, we try to cooperate with the uh, law enforcement bodies uh, in Ukraine and we try to um, strength uh, their capacity because uh, you know um, they are unfortunately Ukrainian law enforcement are not uh, reformed yet we uh, had no time to uh, to do this unfortunately because we uh, we are you know uh, every time we we are doing everything at hoc because we are in in the situation of war for the uh, last uh, eight years uh, and uh, so the capacity of our um, security service police and uh, general uh, prosecutor's office are not enough to investigate all those uh, crimes unfortunately but we um, our civil society uh, try is trying to uh, to strengthen them to uh, to help them to investigate and uh, I have to say that uh, there are a lot of prosecutors who are uh, very very um, you know like uh, maybe they are not so such professional as we uh, want them but um, they uh, have uh, um, the initiative is very strong and they uh, they are working uh, without uh, weekends and uh, uh, sometimes it is uh, 24 hours on, on a day and uh, they uh, they are doing a huge huge work um, for example uh, prosecutor Kravchenko from Bucha um, we saw them uh, from the morning till a deep night uh, and he um, he he was personally during the exhuma exhumation uh, process when when the bodies were um, uh, were like uh, dig from the graves and uh, he he was present personally on uh, during this process uh, and uh, he he has done a, a huge job in Bucha you know it is and. Uh, psychologically they are mentally it is uh, not easy to investigate all these uh, crimes but um, they are trying to do their best and i have to say that um, um i um, really i was no um expected a lot from them but uh, they surprised me a lot i, I mean um, our law enforcement bodies Yes, well, I think everyone viewing today will feel the same way about you. Uh, in a way, there's been many heroes, and I definitely consider you one of those. I know many people focus on feeding the soul, and you've been feeding our mind as well as our, our minds of what is possible. I know Chef Jose Andres who was doing the World Central Kitchen, and they're providing humanitarian meals in and around Ukraine. And he said after his restaurant was hit with hit with missiles, he said, many ways to fight, we do it with food. And I definitely want to thank you because you do it with the pen and with the computer and with the truth. And based on all that you've shared with us today, also heart, it's, it's journalism, not beyond borders, but beyond belief that you don't forget the people you interview and you understand that they're not just quotes, that they are people that deserve dignity. And so we thank you for setting up the media initiative. And we look forward to communicating with you more in the future. And you inspire me the same way that I heard uh, Bono and the Edges acoustic performance of Walk On. And one thing they said there is that Ukrainians are fighting for our freedom too, and that they're actually living and actually dying for the ideal that is freedom. And we thank you for the work that you're doing with the pen and it's the best way to honor world press day is to be able to speak it with you who knows how important it is and we thank you for that and we look forward to the moment when we can celebrate the liberation and the continued nation of ukraine thank you for joining us today mahalo thank you for your support and um, have a nice day and i hope you 
uh, to meet you in Kyiv and to, to talk uh, you personally in Kyiv, in uh, liberated Kyiv, in freedom, in free Kyiv. And uh, uh, the, Kyiv is the capital of free people. So come here. <laughs> that sounds good. I was there in 2016, so I'll come back again. Oh, of course, of course. We are waiting for you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Hello. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.